Okay, now let's talk about the infinitesimal and what it is and a little bit of history too. When we, uh, when we are dealing with dx and dy, those are those quantities and we, that, are, that are infinitely small. So we're calculating a slope, for example, and we take a little tiny interval here, an infinitely small interval dx and an infinitely small interval dy right there. Those quantities are called infinitesimals or sometimes called infinitesimal quantities. Uh, you can think of them as being really tiny. You can think of them as being infinitely small. You can think of them as being instead of uh, a fourth or a fifth or a sixth, you can think of them as being an infinite. So really, really tiny. The word is used to refer to things that are not quite zero, but so close to zero that they cannot possibly be measured. Um, James Gleick, in his biography of Newton, he referred to infinitesimals as quantities that simultaneously are and are not zero. So it's something that is basically zero in size, but can still be used in calculation. Now when we do this calculation, and we're going to calculate a little slope of that infinitely small segment, and we say the slope is dy over dx, a lot of mathematicians have a problem with this. Because if dx is zero, then you're dividing by zero. And so some mathematicians and some calculus professors go to great pains to define dx and dy as finite non-zero quantities. Morris Klein, for example, a famous calculus professor, wrote a great book on calculus back in the 1960s. And he emphatically states that dy dx should not be thought of as a quotient. And that the, the calculus teacher should not teach his student that it is a quotient. He should not be thought of as dy over dx. And um, I am not trying to be critical of Morris Klein by any means or other calculus teachers that do that. But I am saying that we can think of dy over dx as a quotient. And intuitively it makes sense that that would be this little slope calculation, the slope of this infinitely small piece of the curve. It has an infinitely small rise and an infinitely small run, and that rise over the run would be the slope of that infinitely small piece. But there's still this issue of dividing by zero, which has given people a problem for a long time. And I would say that most people don't have a problem treating these quantities as algebraic entities that can be divided like this. Uh, most engineers and physicists, people who use calculus on a day-to-day -day basis, think of them that way. But mathematicians do have a problem with that because they don't like to divide by zero. Interestingly, infinitesimals go all the way back to Archimedes. So this is the 200s BC. This is almost 2,000 years before Newton and Leibniz. Here's a picture of Archimedes thinking, of course, as he always did. Um, Archimedes used infinitesimal quantities in some of his work, although he did not like them. But we do have record of their use and of his work, which is fascinating. Archimedes could do calculations such as this. If you have, say, a parabola and a line cutting through it, we would call that a secant line, and you want to calculate this area. Archimedes realized that you could divide this up into little strips and sum up the area of all of those pieces. And if you let those little strips become infinitely small, that you would get an exact calculation. And he called this his method of exhaustion. And it involved getting um, some rectangles that were below this line and other rectangles that were above this line and establishing an upper and lower bound for this area and then letting those rectangles get infinitely small and exhausting the possibilities of what that area could be in the process. And while as far as we know Archimedes didn't work through any theory of differentiation, here he was clearly thinking along the lines of integral calculus. And this, this, this became apparent or even more apparent than it had been in the past with the discovery of a particular document that has, I think, a fascinating history. It's known as the Archimedes Palimpsest. The Archimedes Palimpsest. That's P-A-L-I-M-P-S-E-S-T. -E this, this word, Palimpsest, that's a librarian's term or, or, or a historian's term. Now, someone who ran a museum would know this word. This refers to a document that has been reused.
a, a long time ago, paper was fairly rare and expensive, difficult to produce. They, they would use parchment. It wasn't really like the paper we have today, although they would write on it, but it was much more difficult to produce. You couldn't just go down to the store and buy 500 sheets for $10. And so because it was relatively difficult to come by, uh, parchments would often be reused. And so you might have a document that had some writing on it, and then you would either wash it or scrape the top layer off and then use it again and write some more text on it or maybe turn it sideways and write some text in another direction and so it's a uh, not uncommon to find documents that have been cleaned off or scraped off and reused and a document that has had that done to it is called a palimpsest this is a picture of the Archimedes palimpsest or one page of it and if you uh, start up here in the top left and read left to right, row after row, that is the text that Archimedes wrote. And then it was rubbed off a little bit, and some monks in the Middle Ages used this uh, parchment to record a liturgical document. And if you start over in this corner and, and read this way, line by line, you're reading the, uh, the medieval liturgical document. Now, this um, on, on a visit to Constantinople in the early 1900s, uh, the Danish historian named Johann Heiberg recognized the text underneath as the work of Archimedes. And he realized from what he could read of it that this was a work that was not otherwise known. So he saw this as historically valuable. And he took some photographs of it and did some translation work. And there was then this translated document uh, of a known work by Archimedes that had not otherwise been discovered until the 1900s. Uh, but most of the text was not readable. There was not enough that was able to be uh, translated from those photographs or not enough that could even be seen in the original documents to get much content from the document. And then, then the palimpsest, the whole, whole document, which is a couple of hundred pages long, that they all look something like this, uh, it disappeared for a while and did not turn up again until the late 1900s. And there was a legal battle involving its ownership, and it eventually uh, went to the terms of the, the court decision, eventually gave the document to Christie's Auction House, and it was auctioned. And it sold at auction for $2 million. An anonymous buyer uh, bought this and donated it to the Walters Museum in Baltimore. And these images are from the Walters Museum. And the Walters Museum has a lot of equipment and personnel there who are capable of analyzing a document like this. And they uh, were able to use computer images and shine various frequencies of light through it and use computers to enhance the images and were able to tease out nearly the entire text underneath by Archimedes. So let's look at this. This is an original um, page here. And here you see it was, this was a fold down here at the bottom. Uh, the original page would have read top to bottom this way, and then the monks turned it sideways and, and creased it, and then they wrote their writing one page here and then the next page there. But if you look at this, you see, like, for instance, see this line right here and this line right here? And let's, uh, let's go back up. You can see faintly in here, look where I'm drawing, you see a, a circle and some lines here. Those are parts of diagrams that Archimedes had drawn on the document. And then the text running horizontally that you see bits of, that's the Greek text by Archimedes. Now, let's look at a computer enhanced image. This is the same document. And look, you can see the, the diagrams very clearly down here. And you can actually read the Greek text very well. That is, if you know Greek. And at least in, in many places, the text is very readable. And the, the people at the museum have put a lot of work into this. From, um, from 1998, at least until about 2008, they were uh, studying this and enhancing these images and drawing out the original text from these, uh, these pages. And there's other works in there, too, just besides the works by Archimedes. But it's fascinating. One of the most original thinkers of all time and one of the great intellects from the ancient world and a work by him that was unknown through almost all of history up until the late 1900s. And now it is, uh, now it is found and is, has been made readable again. That is just stunning that they're able to do that. 
Now the point, the point here for this discussion is that in in these pages is a work by Archimedes known as The Method and in that he clearly uses infinitesimal quantities in his calculations. And so I bring all this up, one, just because I find it fascinating that this document even exists, but two, just to point out that, uh, that the use of infinitesimals goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks over 2,000 years ago and almost 2,000 years before Leibniz and Newton.